Okay, so we're going to jump into the church at Thyatira in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Is everyone with me? Okay. All right. Now, in most of the letters, you're going to see a structure. You're, he's going to address, you're going to see the church that's being addressed. He, and, like, and like any good leader, you, feel, you, know, you bring someone into your office, you first talk about what they're doing well, their strengths. And it will commend them usually about what, what's going well in their life. And then he's going to flip it and say the failures or the problems that they're encountering in that particular church. And then he'll give them instructions. Sometimes it's very simple. It's like, hey, wake up or stop doing that <laughs> or whatever it might be. But usually it's the word repent or watch and whatever. Okay, and then there's promises to those that are faithful. So he, he kind of says, hey, if you do what I say, this is what's waiting for you. Now, a lot of times, that's pointed towards our heavenly kingdom. Okay, but also some rewards uh, here on earth. All right, so let's go into the text for the church at Thyatira. Let's read, let's read the whole letter, and then we'll start breaking it down. To the church in Thyatira, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and his feet are like burnished, are like burnished bronze. Remember, we talked about this in the first class about how Jesus appeared. He goes back to this image. He says, "I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you: you tolerate that woman Jezebel." who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her, strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I, I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. The one that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. He who, whoever has ears, let, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, Thyatara. Let's go first to the church. What are we looking at here? In this particular town, Thyatara, it's a great commercial town in Asia Minor. It's connected, uh, it connected Smyrna and Byzantium. So it was a, a lot of times it was a passageway through. Um, it's like south of the border, you know. And it's kind of like in between Florida and Maryland. Everyone stops there, uh, but much more spectacular, obviously, than south of the border. Uh, some of the, pro yeah, it was known for uh, fortune telling. A lot of people went there to get their fortune, fortunes read. Uh, there, uh, and uh, there was this, uh, an oracle named Samabath. So this famous woman who used to, you know, people would travel all over to get read. And we, we'll talk, remember we talk about it. You're not supposed to do these things as Catholics. It can lead to uh, allowing demonic spirits enter into your life. And so we have this town. It's pretty wealthy. And he starts off with this compliment. And what's the compliment? He says, I know your deeds, your faith. Um, and he says, you have persevered. All right. And he also says, what does he also say? He says here in the text, in the beginning, uh, he says, and you are now doing more than you did at first. All right, so for ourselves, we've got to think about our, our life as a Catholic. Can we say over the last five years, we're doing more than we did five years ago? Hopefully, yes, right? But also, you know, we're going to see that he's going to slam them with, okay, that's great, you're growing holier, but the church at large, right? The community has some problems. And so he's, he's saying, you know, your faith is strong. You're stronger than you used to be. You're growing holier. Uh, but then he goes into the failures. And what's the failure? The failure is, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Right? Now, you never want to be called a Jezebel. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a really not a, uh, a compliment, especially to a woman uh, at all. And what, let's go to the biblical background of Jezebel. Now, where do we see Jezebel? We see her in the book of Kings. Now, there's one Kings 21, 5 to 15. 
and then 2 Kings 9, 29 to 37. All right, I'll just give you a little, a little background on Jezebel, right? So she was uh, the daughter of the king of Sidon, a town in Lebanon, and uh, she was the wife of King Ahab of Israel in the northern part of the kingdom. Okay, so she was a queen, right? And um, she was particularly noted for having worship of the god Baal popular in Israel. Okay, so Baal was a pagan god. Now remember, what does God hate? He doesn't like when we worship other gods. Now she also is a woman of authority. And because she's a woman of authority, uh, because of her example, she's going to also lead many other people to what? To pagan worship. Okay? And... Um, there, and so the problem, Baal was a fertility god, okay? And, um, and when you worship this particular god, it wasn't just so you burned a little bit of incense. There was usually, um, it involved immoral sexual practices that a person would perform in front of this pagan god as an act of worship. It was pretty satanic, all right? And, uh, and these other sorts of practices. And there was, in, around the temple, it was in honor of the God were places of prostitu prostitution, both male and female, associated with the worship of Baal. Okay, so it's, it's pretty sick stuff going on in this particular town uh, with this woman. Now, um, she herself supported over 800 prophets of Baal, and she ate, and they ate at her table. Okay, that's key. They would come and she would eat with these people. All right? Um, and, um, and then, you remember, she also was... Uh, that um, remember uh, she had that little little fight with Elijah, and they had the, the prophets were going back and forth, and, and he kind of brought down the fire of God upon them. Okay, that this is all sort of uh, she was ruthless, a moral seducer of the people, and uh, and so Jesus uses her as the example of this particular woman in the community that is m leading many of the p church people away from God through pagan worship and also what sexual immorality. Now the word immorality, you know what that is in Greek? It's, uh, St. Paul uses it a lot. The word for moral, immorality that we see here is porneia. Okay? And obviously from that word we get the word, what? Pornography. Right? So it's, it, when the word doesn't mean just, it's just like, it's not like, it's basically all types of sexual sin is kind of consumed into that particular world, word. So what's happening in this church, we've got a collection of really strong, you know, practicing Catholics, but we have a lot of them that have been seduced by this particular Jezebel into pagan worship, right? And then, and then secondly, uh, with that sexual immorality. Now, I think the way to look at it is this, is why would these people compromise so much in their faith? Okay, well, the reason would be this, is that the, this is a, a commercial town, and so, you know, they had certain guilds that if you join these particular guilds, you had job security, right? And so, you know, I think a lot of people, they probably didn't just jump into these pagan, these pagan practices, but they would join the guilds for commercial prosperity. So what do we see there is that many of these people, these Christians in Thyatira, they're going to compromise their faith for financial gain. Okay, you praying with me? All right, so uh, now let's think, about, let's think about a modern guild where that happens in the United States of America that's very popular. Freemasonry, exactly. So I think in, in some ways there, there is, uh, implicitly I think we're, we're you're probably, you know, this is kind of the modern day Thyatara would be Freemasonry. Now I did a podcast on Freemasonry. You can listen online with Father Jack. And I, I think for a lot of people it's enlightening. Um, and... Um, you know, and, and just so you know, just a little uh, little sketch on this, is that um, Catholics that join Masons are in the state of grave sin and actually are implicitly excommunicated from the Catholic Church for joining the, the Freemasons. It, we take it that seriously. And one of the reasons is, is that through the indoctrination of Freemasonry, which is probably the same thing that's happened in Thyatara, that these people, the, the, these Catholics, their, their faith is going to be watered down little by little to the point of they will uh, be asked when you get to higher levels to basically apostatize and mock Jesus Christ and also his holy Catholic church. Okay? And um, I, I just, I was, uh, I think I told this story in the podcast. When I was teaching at the high school, at Pilate High School, uh, one of the, we had 
for the first time in many years, a young man from my parish at St. Mary's in Laurel uh, joined the seminary. And uh, it was right around graduation, and he came up to me, and he's like, Father, I just, this group came up, and, and lo and behold, they gave me a $2,000 check. And I'm thinking, whoa, the Knights of Columbus have never been that, <laughs> that generous. And I'm like, well, who gave it to you? I'm like, this, they must be some great Catholic people. And like, they're called the Freemasons. And I was like, oh boy. I was like, you gotta come into my office. And like, I kind of dropped the bomb. I'm like, you can't, you gotta give that. He's like, $2,000, I've never even touched a check this big. I'm like, I know, you gotta bring, give it back. And then, then I went over to the principal and he just kind of got quiet. He's like, there's a problem with Freemasonry. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm thinking, all right, we might have opened up a can of worms here, right? Uh, but I, you know, you'll notice that it is, there are a lot of people that they just unknowing to join these guilds. And I'm not saying that Freemasonry is uh, involved with sexual immorality per se, but they definitely the pagan side of it is taken care of. Um, but anyway, whatever's going on in this particular guild, in order to join it, you had to, you had to enter into this pagan worship, and God hates idolatry, and, 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 and also tied in with that is also, you know, uh, sexual impropriety. Now, we got this meat problem. And now, we, we know about this meat problem also. St. Paul will speak about this. Then we know what the problem with the meat was. Well, the problem with the meat was essentially this, right? Is that, you know, in these meals, they would, they would sacrifice something, they would cook the meat, and it was probably darn good, you know, top of the line beef, you know? I mean, we're talking, you know, grade A, you know, type steaks. And, uh, and so they, you know, after they sacrificed the animal, well, they got these great things, you know, steaks coming off the grill, and they're like, or they give a lot of the meats to the meat markets, like Hancock's or something like that. And then, you know, Christians are like, well, I mean, you know, should we eat it? Uh, but what was the problem? The problem was, is this, meat was, was involved with a, a pagan ritual. Now, St. Paul, he, you know, he kind of toes a middle ground on this. You know, a lot of people, it's, you know, he, I think in, in, that, in that respect, he says, if it's bringing scandal, don't, don't eat it. But if it is bringing scandal, uh, you, you know, I mean, if it brings scandal, don't eat it. But it doesn't, and maybe the meat's fine, even as such, if you bought it in the market. But there, let's just say at this point, they weren't supposed to eat the meat if it was, if it was used in a pagan ritual, okay? Um, and they saw it as what a compromise, right? You know, they we're taking sort of um, we're taking meat that's tainted. <laughs> All right, I could go in a direction here, but I'll, I'll stand back a little bit, right? Uh, but the, you know, w watch out for tainted materials, right? And um, and so you know, but I, I think too is you know the problem with Jezebel and this and this guild is their basic philosophy is business is business, right? And um, and and I, I think too the bigger problem than just the sexual morality. And also the problem with the, the paganism was essentially is that um, if you're in the business world or, you know, you're trying to make it in the world and your life is being compromised, you know, because of your faith, your faith has to go. Now, where do we see that today? In our country. I mean, we're, we're simply, we're simply compromising left and right to pagan gods, you know, get involved with, you know, rituals that are somewhat satanic and from Satan. I mean, however you see it. I mean, it's, 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 it's modern day problems that, that's happening. And, and our Lord is, 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 you know, saying this, that bottom line, our Lord's telling Thyatira and us is, you know, we cannot compromise on faith and morals to climb the corporate ladder. Okay, and, and I think that's, you know, um, one of the temptations of John Paul II uh, says is legitimizing the unwarranted separation of faith from life. In other words, uh, you know, and I, and I think too is, uh, you know, if you're a Catholic doctor, you're not, you're not supposed to, um, you know, prescribe birth control pills. And if you're a business owner, I mean, you know, you got to give a just wage and no matter what. And, you know, I mean, if you work at a hospital, you're not to participate in an ab abortion, period. You know, I mean, just even being a nurse, you cannot engage in practices that compromise your faith. But what we're seeing, I think, as they saw back then, is there's this constant pressure is if you don't do this, you don't have what? A job. So uh, the problems of Thyroid Tower, the problems of what? Modern, of our modern age. Um, I love this line of Patti Smith. Patti Smith always went to Mass. He never missed a Sunday, but Patti Smith went to hell for what he did on Monday. And I think that's what our Lord is saying to these people. Now, <clears throat> Um, so then, so that's, that's the bottom line, I think, the connection with, with us today. And I think that the second thing is this is, um, then we see this vision of Christ. And look, what was the thing about his eyes? His eyes were what? They're fiery. 
All right, what do you think that means? Well, I mean, so this comes, write this down, if you want to look it up later, uh, Daniel chapter, uh, well actually I'll read the verse, but it's Daniel chapter 10 verse 6. And listen to what the prophet Daniel says, his face was like the appearance of lightning and his eyes of burning torches. So when Daniel had this image of, 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 our, of God, it, it, was this, it was this image that, that Thyatira, that, that, that uh, Jesus appeared to this particular church. And these burning eyes symbolize two things, all right? And the first thing is, it's, um, it's this blazing anger against sin and the awful penetration of the gaze which strips away and sees into man's inmost heart. Like, I mean, this is, this is a very powerful image that God's fiery eyes just looks through evil and just wants to just consume it with his fire. You know, I mean, you think about when, a lot of times in, when our Lord is, is looking at the apostles, they were very moved by what? His gaze. Now, when you looked in Christ's eyes, something happened to you. And everyone that saw Christ, they felt like what? He's looking right into me. Well, guess what? He still does that upstairs when you go to adoration. And when you pray, he still has those fiery, you know, penetrating eyes that see right through us. And if we're willing to look bad, it'll penetrate and burn, burn the sin out of us. If we're willing to open up our hearts and minds to this fiery, powerful, healing gaze of Christ. You know, so it's not like just this, okay, you know, this, this you know, uh, burning, this thing. But a lot of times, you know, like a lot of times when people have been away from the church, another image, right? What do they say when they walk into church? It feels like, I'm on fire. <laughs> well, maybe they're experiencing what? This gaze, this fiery gaze of Christ, the burning eyes. Um, and so we've, we've got this, this fiery gaze. And then, and, then, uh, and then he goes into these, these warnings if they do not repent. And um, he says, I have given her a time to repent of her immorality, if she, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of, of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am, I am, God, who searches hearts and minds, and I will pay each according to your deeds. So if the first thing he says, I will cast her in on a bed of suffering. And what does that mean? This bed of suffering. All right, now, you'll notice that Jesus says one word three times, repent. All right? We know that we've gone through this word numerous times already. What's the Greek word? Metanoia, which means turn away and toward, towards me. Turn away from this evil, walk away from the bomb, turns towards me. And, uh, and so the Greek word, it, it's, so this bed, this bed that he's talking about, this bed of suffering, uh, it was a, 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 the Greek word is, is Klein, uh, sort of like, I guess, I'm not Calvin Klein, I don't, know if that, I don't think that's the right spelling, but it's K-L-I-N-E -K is the Greek word for bed, okay? And it, it was more of a couch that you would recline at banquets. So you know, you ever see like, you know, movies about ancient world, and they're like kind of, they're like chilling on their couch, eating steak, it's just kind of weird, but that's, that's how they ate back then. You know, you, you didn't sit down, you laid down and ate, you know. <laughs> they lay down, let's have something to eat. You know, it was just kind of a different way of, of, of sitting. You know, they, they didn't have tables back then. That's why in the, the movie, The Passion of Christ, like it's a little bit off, like they, they didn't have tables like that with chairs. That was much later. You, you had a little, a little, you know, a cushion, and. Uh, maybe more like the Japanese do, you know, you kind of, uh, and so forth. But, but anyway, this, this bed is, is uh, a, a banquet. So basically, uh, Jesus, uh, and this is the same thing that Jesus would recline at the Last Supper, uh, but the couch on which she ate uh, was, um, he said that this pleasure you're seeking will turn, uh, will turn to pain somehow. Like it's going to ruin you physically. And quite frankly, that, that happens a lot of times, you know, when people don't repent of certain types of sins, especially sexual morality, ends, they end up in a bed of pain, right? I mean, in a sense, like sometimes, you know, sin has a way of taking a toll on bodies, right? And it, it was destroying the body, you know, if we're not, I mean, when, when the Lord or the church, you know, gives these, these beautiful teachings, not so we can make life horrible, it's so you're healthy and holy and, and live a, a good life. But many people, you know, have found, you know, uh, they've gotten sick over these matters. Um, and, but then the other thing is, you know, this bed of suffering is also turning to an es eschatological meaning, meaning the end times. What's the bed of suffering? The couch of suffering. Eternal fire. 
He's ba- I mean, I mean, just jumping to jumping to the point. He's like, you know, if you're, in, you know, you will end up in this bed of suffering. You'll be laying down in this for eternity, this eternal punishment, and um, and so the bed is. A, it's actually the bed he's talking about. You'll end up in a sick bed, right? A sick bed. If you don't turn away from your sin, right? He's saying, I'm warning you. I'm warning your country. I'm warning your church. You know, you're killing yourself. He says, you repent, right? And so that, that's the suffering that, that for those who do not. But then he talks about the promises and rewards, right? So we go, the instruction, what's the instruction? It's like three words, but it's the same word. What is it? Repent. And get off the couch. <laughs> right, get off the couch and, you know, be a Christian. Get away from these pagan practices. And then, so what are the promises? And so he says to the rest of you, Thyatara, to you who do not hold her teaching, those that are not getting involved with this, he says, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. That's very powerful. That have not learned Satan's deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. And then he goes on to say, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule over them with an iron scepter and I will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I receive authority from my Father, I will also give that one. The morning star, circle that word. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so let's go through, let's go through the promises, the good news for those that listen to God. And that's us. He says, number one, I will give you authority over the nations and I will dash them to pieces like pottery. And, and, and so what we're, he's saying is, I will, give, I will help you. I will help you smash this pagan nation. Like I will, they, will, they, will, they will eat their words and you will end up victorious and I will make sure that this pagan culture that's trying to consume, consume you will not reign. I will be what? Victorious. And I think too, we have to remember Christ, when Christ preaches, he's not talking like, hey, you're doomed. He's like, I, let's remember I'm in charge. I'm the Alpha and what? The Omega. Like, I got this covered. Just follow me. And we're going to destroy this pagan nation. And so, like, all, all us Catholics are like, oh, what's going on with our world? Hey, just do the right thing. And guess what? We're going to win. I'm going to smash them like pottery. Have you ever, have you ever I mean, let's just look at that image for a moment. Have you ever smashed pottery before? If you haven't, you haven't lived, right? I mean, it's like, I mean like, when you smash pottery, it just, it just explodes, you know? I mean, it's not like I mean, a glass, but with pottery, it's just, it just, it's like, it goes into thousands of pieces. It's like, there's no way of gluing that thing together. You drop pottery, it's over, right? You drop, you know, you drop something else, all right, you might be able to fix it, but not pottery. All right. And this is a reference to Psalm 2. Okay, Psalm 2. Um, let's go to another thing. He says, I will give them and us the morning star. All right. What's the morning star? All right, now there's two meanings. Um, so, um, this passage may be a symbol of the Christian share in the resurrection and glory of Christ since Venus. Um, so, it kind of in the pain where there's this idea that, you know, the morning star was this idea of a new beginning. And so, I will allow you to share in my resurrection, right? So, it's, it's basically saying this, I will give you this new life and ultimately heaven, a life of the resurrection. Uh, but another, another, another very interesting interpretation of this is that, because remember, John is speaking, he's talking a lot about satanic stuff, I mean, or Jesus is talking about a lot of satanic stuff. The morning star is a reference to Lucifer. All right, now, why do I say that? Um, turn to Isaiah 14, verse 12. All right, Isaiah 14, 12 says, he, he speaks, now, remember, does anybody know what the word Lucifer, Lucifer is the kingpin of hell, the the major, de- the major demon, the head of all hell, right? And the, f- the one who disobeyed God and said to God, non servium, right? So he was good and he was powerful, the most powerful of the angels. And God put them to the test and what happened? He says, I will not follow you, right? So he, he and the word looser means light bearer, right? Now, listen to what it says in Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You were once laid lo- lo- well, you, you who once laid low the nations. So the, Isaiah is talking about the morning star is Satan who was kicked out of, of uh, 
heaven by Michael. Okay, so our Lord is basically saying, uh, what is he saying to us? That you will conquer Lucifer once and for all if you do what I say. You'll win. So, I mean, it's like, I'll, I'll even, ha I'll conquer the morning star, Lucifer you, no more fighting, it's over. So it's a powerful, it's a powerful image of what? Staying away from these deep secrets and following the light of Christ. And what, what, what will happen? We will defeat what? The morning star. Okay? All right, let's go to the next church. So that was 25 minutes. We got one church done. All right, next church. Uh, can we do questions at the end? Yeah, let's just, let's just let's go, we'll do it at the end, I promise you. We'll, we'll start like 8 o'clock. I'll, I'll answer as many questions for five minutes as possible. <laughs> All right, I'll keep going. All right, here we go. Sardis. All right, because I... Yeah, because if we, if we keep stopping, we'll, we will be on chapter four in like five weeks. It's just so much. Okay, here we go. So let's go to Sardis. All right, to the angel of the church in Sardis. Now, who's the angel? The bishop. To the bishop of Sardis. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, and yet you are dead. Be constantly alert and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. Then, if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who overcomes will be clothed in, in the same way, in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before, before his angels, the one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so, all right, let's start with the city, right? Could we go in this, this, this schematic here that's usually, and it's not perfect like this, but Jesus pretty, has perfect letters, so it's, always, it's pretty similar. But the first thing is we talk about the city. All right, what was, Sardis was a wealthy city, and um, uh, it's... Um, you know, what was the reason? Well, it's another commercial town, um, and it was thriving. And, uh, and he says to them, what does he say here? Like, they just, it just seems like a very vibrant, vibrant um, city. But he says, I know your deeds, all right, that you have a name and that you're alive, but you are dead. So uh, here he's, he kind of, like our Lord goes, he talks about Sardis, but then he, right away, he doesn't really give an encouragement. He goes straight for the juggler. He just, he kind of, like, because I don't, um, he really doesn't give them any commendation till the end. Yeah, he actually doesn't give any sort of compliment to him. And that's, that's kind of interesting, because in every other letter, he always says, you know, you've been persevering, and you've been good, and this, and this one, he's like, no, you, you think you're pretty alive, but you're actually dead. All right, now, um, this body of the letter of Sardis seems to indicate that the church has almost completely compromised once again with the pagan culture of the city. And they were taking this ecumenical approach with the other religions, right? Like kind of, it's called syncretism, where you take and you take from different religions and kind of pull them in so we can all be friends. But what happens is what? If you're not careful, what's going to happen? You dumb down your religion, you have nothing left at all. Where are we seeing that too? The Catholic Church. Trying to make it like, like the Protestants and, you know, we'll be fun and we're going to be, you know, uh, relative to everybody. and eh. It's not going to work because, remember, the Word of God is constant. Our culture is what? Very, not, not it's very incon. It's not. I mean, it just can't change. And, and we got to stop playing this game and trying to be relative to everybody. Right? I mean, here's the thing. Not everyone's going to be happy today. I mean, here's, you don't like the Word of God. I'm sorry to say tough. You know, this is, this is His Word. And, and Sardis is just is playing too many games. And, um, and so what they're, what they're guilty of, we're not really sure. You know, that's the thing about this. It's very vague. He doesn't tell them exactly like he did with the other ones. He said, oh, you the pagan practices and your sexual morality. But this one, he's, he's not really telling us. But he just says, you're dead. Okay, now, let's step back theologically. What kills the soul for, you know, from our Catholic theology? All right, yeah, but what type of sin? Okay, good. Now, this, it's just good, good to step back because not every sin kills you, right? There's two, there's, and I, I, I think this is, this is something that, you know, I mean, I think in, in Protestant denominations, like sin is sin and 
It's all, but it, everyone knows that's bogus. There's, there's some things that are just, they're not good and they're sinful, but they're not deadly, right? And, and then there's other things that will kill the soul. And this is, this is where I think like our, us and, and the Protestant denominations differ in belief, right? Because, you know, this, this idea of once saved, always saved, and all I have to do is believe, and well, well, can you come back to life? And, and <laughs> what if I ruin it? Or I mean, I, I, mean, I, I just, there's really, I have no say in the matter, I have no freedom. Right? Because one thing about Christianity and our relation to Christ, it, it entails what? Freedom. Freedom to live or to die. Freedom to follow God or to disobey Him. Right? That's never changed. And our whole life is about choices. You know? It's like, make good choices. You know? <laughs> yeah? But I mean, so what, let's, let's, let's step back. And, um, so what's, and let's, just, let's just go to the theology of mortal sin. Just, I, I know you know this, but just review, right? Three, three aspects of a mortal sin. In order for a sin to be mortal, there has to be three conditions, right? And all three have to be present. So the first thing is that the Bible, the Word of God, and the church teach that's grave matter, right? The second thing that has to be there for a sin to be mortal is that a person has to have full knowledge that it's wrong. In other words, they've been taught properly, and they're aware of it. They, they've been, they know. Their, their conscience has been formed properly, and they know it's wrong. They know that the Word of God and the church teaches is grave matter. And thirdly, they have, a person must have what? Full consent of the will. All right. So what happens if one of the three is lacking? It's knocked down to a venial sin. If all three are present, it's what? Mortal sin, right? And that's, that's a way of you know, distinguishing, you know, is it, you know, you look at the three things and, all right, it's the catechism and what does the church tell you about this? It's grave matter. Well, if I didn't know, okay, it might have been a venial sin then, but if I do it again, it's what? Right? So it, it makes sense. And, it, it's, it's, and it's, so God is not unfair, right? But I, also I think what the problem is, is this, is because of a lack of teaching and catechesis, a lot of people are just doing whatever. They have no idea that they're hurting God or even hurting themselves. You know, because we were made by love to love for love. Right? And I think that's, that's one of the things. But, but so he says, so, but what, so what, what does he say here? Um, so he basically, what's his, what's his uh, advice? How do they get out of it? He says, remember what you have received and learn and keep it. All right, so he's like, hey, remember the teaching I gave you. Uh, and he says, and learn, but, but not just, you know this, like, do it. Keep it, right? Remember what he said to the church, the church, like, where is the love you used to have? Like, just turn back to me, right? So remember, that, remember what, you know, Sister Daphne told you, or, or your theology told you in high school, and just, like, don't, don't play these mind games and just, and just say, oh, it doesn't matter. No, like, go back to what you've been taught, and if you haven't taught, well, learn it, Right? And then, and then he says, repent, okay? Um, now for us, I mean, the, the sacrament for, for, for us as Catholics is that uh, we say that the ordinary way of that happening uh, is in confession, right? That we have to bring our mortal sins and we have to name them by kind and number. What happened how many times? You know, clearly. So like, and now you're not sort of smudging, but like, all right, bless me, Father, I sin. I repent of the following things. Um, he, he says this, remember, and, and he says, repent. All right, so it's very simple. He just says, rem remember and repent, R&R. &R. All right, so going on, he goes, the warning. Um, so what's the warning? He says, then if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you will know, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Okay, now the warning is, is like, look, he's just saying like, hello, folks, all right? Like, and I, and I, I think also this is a problem I think with preaching is like, we're not warning people of anything. I mean, I'm not saying myself included, but I mean, at times I can do better, but I, we're not telling people like, hey, there's good and evil. Here's the here's good, this is evil, choose. I mean, it's very simple, but preaching's not like that today. And what happens when you preach like that? You get what? You get canceled, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the problem. I mean, that, that's the problem today. And, and, I, and here's the thing. Until you all start speaking up, for us, it's going to keep canceling. All right? The problem is the silence of the laity, too. you got to speak up. All right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to save souls. 
What are you trying to do? Keep your priests alive. All right? So, if you're not alert, I'll come like a thief. Now, what is he talking about? What's the thief? Death. He goes, here's the truth of the matter. You're all going to die. <laughs> I'm coming. And you do not know what? The day nor the hour. Okay? Now, once again, he's repeating what he's told us before in the Gospels. So, our Lord's come back after he, the risen Christ. This is after he's walked the earth. And he says, hey, remember those things I used to talk about? Let's have a little, re let's have a little like, a reminder session here. Let's, let's review some of the messages I, I taught you. It's only been like 50 years and you guys are already going down the wrong path. I've only been gone for 40 some years and look at it. You're making a mess of this earth. <laughs> All right, what do you think about today? <laughs> oh boy, you know, I've been gone for 2,000 years and whoo, I'm coming back for good, you know. Um, but he goes on, uh, you know, there's a, there's a church in Italy and you, you probably heard this anecdote before where it's, uh, it's made out of skulls of Franciscans, right? And so in the, it's all, it's like walls are plastered and this particular church, like there was, uh, I guess there was some water damage or what, back in the 15th century or whatnot. And uh, so one of the brothers decided to just take the skulls out of the caskets, they were already broken, and he just lined the walls with all the bones and skulls of the, of the, of the, of the priest and the brothers. Uh, it's, it's one of the coolest and creepiest churches I've ever been in. And there's this sign when you get to the end of this, like, you know, little tour. It says, what you are now, we once were, what, what we are now, you shall be. You know, it says in Italian, Latin, and English. And it just remembers, memento mori, remember what? Remember death. And I, and I think, too, it's, it's like, we've got to little, be a little bit more sober about this, is that God never promises us what? Tomorrow. And I think, too, we have to teach, we have to... We have to really take, I mean, and we, we, we just, because we're so narrow-minded, because we have this idea that we, we'll live forever, and, you know, I mean, I, and I think when you're younger, it's more like that. I mean, dumb things I used to do and think, oh, you know, whatever. But, like, the older you get, you start taking, isn't it true, like, wisdom and life, just, you begin to take life a little bit more seriously. Your, your choices are much more clear, and you're like, you know what? I only got so much time left on this, this planet, Right? And he says, so be alert. Matthew 24, uh, verses 42 to 44, he says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have let his house not be broken into. Okay, so that's the warning. It's basically like, wake up, repent, remember, you know, otherwise I'm coming like a thief. All right? Now, I'm not saying this. Who's saying this? Jesus, the Lord, okay? Um, now, he goes on to say this, but you have few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who overcomes will be clothed in the same way, in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so once again, we have the church. We got this, well, we didn't have too many strengths. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> All right, we didn't have too many strengths there, but we had, uh, uh, you know, failures that we're not sure what they are, but all we know is this. Whatever they were doing, it was serious. It was a serious compromise, and a vast majority of the church was simply what? Dead. Spiritually what? Dead. And I wonder, too, like, I, if, we could, if we could get, like, COVID tested for people's, like, spiritual life, I wonder how many people would test up positive for mortal sin today. Can you imagine? Like, I would love that. All right, before you come in, beep. <laughs> All right, go see Father Jack. Beep. Go see Father Jack. Oh, well, come on in. Beep. I mean, it would be hilarious, you know. You don't like that idea, do you? <laughs> All right, all right. You know, anyway. So, where were we? Okay, so we're going to the, to the, the, the instructions we talk about. It's, but then we go to the, to the um, promises of those who are faithful. Now, but he, notice what he says. There are few people in Sardis. I mean, if I was a Sardinian, I'm like, gosh, man, what did we do wrong? I mean, you were like, I mean, the last church, you know, they were doing some really wicked things, but at least you like gave them some encouragement. They're like, you, know, you few people. So they're like a couple, couple people on the side. He says, so what's the rewards? He says, 
He says the few who have not soiled their white garments. Okay, all right, step back. What's the white garment? All right, think about it. Come on. You've all done, you've all brought your babies to the church, and after you baptize the baby, what do you put on the baby? A white garment. All right, what, what, why do you dress your baby in white? Because it looks cool? No. Why? It's, it's a, it's, this is biblical. It, it's, it's speaking about this life of God, this life, the ba the, this baby now, because of baptism, has received this new, light in, this new life in Christ. And um, one of the prayers in the new rite, which I do, and we've done since the 19, you know, late 1960s, early 70s, uh, basically says this, after the baby's baptized, we'll say, John, or whatever the baby's name, you have become a new creation and have closed your yourself in Christ. See in this white garment the outward sign of your Christian dignity with your family and friends. And it says, uh, bring this in with your family and friends unstained into the everlasting life of heaven. Now notice the directive. When, when, when the priest puts out on the baby, we're saying, look, I mean, for seven years, you're going to have this white suit on, right? How long can you keep it white? Right? And so, I mean, in a sense, like this white, the white dress, and it's also symbolic of when a woman comes up for a marriage. It's a symbol of her purity, right? Her virginity, right? And all this that, that brings to the altar. But it's still, for, for Christians, this is, a, this is an image, of, this is an image of, the, of, of every one of us. When we're in the state of grace, we're wearing a white garment. And our Lord says, you must bring that garment unstained into the everlasting life of heaven. Now, if we stain our garments, or if it gets torn off, get a new wardrobe, <laughs> by what? Remembering and repenting, go to confession, get a new outfit, bring it to the dry cleaner, <laughs> right? get her done. <laughs> All right? But we, the important thing here is we have to show up to heaven with the right dress code. Now, where do we, now there's other Gospels, right, where Jesus speaks about this. The wedding, the wedding feast. And remember what happens to the one guy, that, that one jokester shows up with flip-flops and, you know, and all this to the banquet. It doesn't turn out so well. He gets thrown out and, and he's wailing and gnashing of teeth, right? You know, he's, a, he's, and he, and he's like, well, who let you into the, who let you into this wedding feast? He's like, well, I didn't know it was a bow tie event. And he's like, yeah, it's called heaven, right? And, and so we're, and this is a reference to Matthew 22, 1 to 14, Luke 14, 16, 24. In that parable, the king gave a great feast for his son's wedding, and he sent all his servants, and he noticed a guest was not wearing a wedding garment, and the king asked him why the man had no excuse, and the king cast him into darkness. And so basically, the, the, the uh, but, but if you're faithful, you're going to show up with the right garment. You'll, you'll be clothed well, you'll, you know, you know, it doesn't matter, like, when we die, it doesn't matter the suit we wear in our casket. You know, I remember once I was at, like, dinner with some priests, and, like, oh, when I die, I want to have, like, the garments and this vest. I'm like, who cares? <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> they're going to look at you for an hour, and then they're going to close it up, and then they're going to bury you. I'm like, you know, I mean, but, like, you know, but that's fine. I mean, we're, you know, and everyone looks great at their funeral. You know, the, everyone's got the, the rosary around their hands, you know. Uncle Bob never prayed that thing, you know? He probably would have Budweiser can in his hand, you know? But, but anyway, all right, let's be serious again, right? But you want to you look good. But you, the thing is, who wants to look like a bum in their casket, but you don't want to show up like a bum when you die? All right? You've got to have the right garment on. Um, okay. And then he says, I shall not blot that name out of the book of life. All right, now, what does this mean, this book of life? Um, well, um, those whose names appear in the book of life, the baptized who profess Christ, are counted and treated as true believers, but they must persevere in their faith throughout their lives. Okay? And uh, a lot of times in the time of, in this, and during this time, uh, a lot of times when you showed up to a, a, a feast, they, I mean, like they do today, you go to a, you know, you go to a wedding party, and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Uh, Swank. And they're like, oh, yes, wait. Stink? No, that's not it. You're like, wait, let me look. I'm sorry, your name's not in the register. You know, you ever, I mean, you ever gone to a place and they, someone forgot to put your name in there? 
Yeah, right? I mean, and guess what? I mean, then there's this whole embarrassing thing where like, I know, I promise I know her, you know? And like, oh, sure you do, pal. You know, and you're out there, you know. And, but you know, your name has to be in the, in the book. And if, here's the thing. If we're in mortal sin, our name is what? It's, it's blotched out of the book of life. It's not in the registry. You're not in the invitation list anymore, right? It gets deleted. But then it gets replaced when we repent and we get the life of Christ. Once again, we have to have our name in the, in the invitation book and number two, what? We gotta have the right garment. All right, we've all been invited to the supper of the Lamb, but you better have your name in the book and you better have your white garment on. Capiche? <laughs> all right, so I mean that. This is, you know, okay. So, nice. Oh, I think we have time for, one, why don't we one more, one more, maybe two more churches. All right, Philadelphia. Here we go. All right, what does Philadelphia mean? The city of brotherly love. Okay. Now we're not talking about where the eagles play, this is in Asia Minor. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, say this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have little power and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come down and bow down at your feet. And make them know that I have loved you, because you have kept the word of, of my perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down of heaven from my God and my new name. You as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. All right. Once again, let's go to the schemata. All right. The church, Philadelphia, right? A little bit about it. Founded in uh, 140 BC uh, by the king of per Pergamum, this, which we already talked about. And um, it was called the Gateway, uh, Gateway of the East. Uh, because the city was on a crossroads that approaches the several provinces, Mysa, Lydia, and Phrygia. And the city's prosperity, uh, because it was sort of like these crossroads, once again, a lot of, a lot of good stuff was happening there. A lot of, uh, they were known for their grape growing and wine, uh, uh, wine producing industry. It was like one of the best wine in, in the area. And uh, it was called a little Athens. And um, it had many temples and beautiful public buildings. Okay, so um, so that's a little background of the city. Or let's talk about what he, how Jesus is, approaches himself and how he. And every time our Lord addresses the church, he gives a title. Now, what's the title that he gives to the, the church of Philadelphia? He says this. Um, he calls himself He who is holy. Right. See, but yeah, he was holy is true, who has the key of David. Now, first off, we've got to figure out why does he call himself he who is holy, and then what's this whole who has the keys of the kingdom of David? Um, now, in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20, uh, the prophet Isaiah will say this in this particular verse, but they will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Okay, so God addresses himself as the Holy One. You know, the one who is holiness himself. And think about it, in the Mass, when we do the Sanctus, 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 Dominus, Deus, Sabo, right? Holy, 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 Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, right? And so we're basically addressing God as he who is holiness himself, right? So he sees this is a title. He's like, I am the source of holiness. I am the definition of holiness. And when you have a life in me, I make you holy, right? Can we become holy outside of Christ? No. But with Christ, we were made sanctus. We're made holy, right? Anyways, we come upon these gifts and make them holy so that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So, um, so that's the first thing. He just he addressed himself this. And then he, he claims to hold the keys of David. All right, write down this verse. 
Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. I, 22, 22. Okay? And uh, in this particular verse, um, and I'll explain what it means, I, Isaiah, and this is, uh, this is going to come back to when, when Jesus uh, gives Peter the keys to the kingdom, right? In Kaiser Philippi, he says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. The sins you retain to retain, the sins you forgive are forgiven. Right? Remember this? All right, so this is all, all these references are to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, which is actually a very important verse for Catholics because the keys have a very, a very important, um, you know, symbolic re uh, significance, right? So, the key, the, 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 um, the verse says this, I will place the keys of the, of the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one will shut. What he shuts, no one will open. Okay, so the, the prophet Isaiah is speaking about the prime minister of the time. And uh, at the time, there was uh, this, the prime minister was Shebda, or Sheb, Shebna, that uh, was the, the name of the prime minister. And God takes away the authority from him, the keys, and he gives them to Iliakum, right? Now, the reason was Shebna was abusing his power. Now, the prime minister, they would actually, at the time, in the, in the, time, of, in the time of David, that the prime minister or during the time of the prophet Isaiah, right, is they would hold keys. And what it represented is I have the key, I have the power of the king. So what I say is the word of the king. Now, what do you think was happening that made God take the keys away from Shebna and give them Elakim? The words of the prime minister were not the words of what? The king. So he stripped the authority and he gave it to to Ali, Ali Akim. Are you seeing that? But what's the important thing? That the keys represent, if you hold the keys, you are the voice of the one above you. So it's a powerful, it's a powerful reference. Now, who did Jesus give the keys to? Simon, right? It's Simon. Now, in, if, you look at, if you look at art with, with, with uh, Peter, what's he always holding? The keys, right? What's that a reference to? Isaiah, 22 verse 22 but also Matthew 16 19 listen to what what Jesus after he changes Peter's name from Simon to Peter kephos means rock upon you I will build what my church upon this rock this strong you know foundation he says I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven right so the Pope is the prime minister of what of Jesus. And we call the Pope the Vicar of Christ. Vicar means what? Voice of Christ. Okay? And so, now, one of the, one of the good things we teach about our Catholic faith is that uh, the Vicar of Christ, now he might say things, right, or there have been Popes that have been saintly men and some have not been holy at all, but they'll never, they, they've also been given this charism of infallibility, which means never can they officially teach something that would be contradictory to the voice of what? Christ, ever. That's an infallible statement. That even the guy was a flaming heretic and wanted to destroy the church, he couldn't because our Lord will not allow his, him to officially abuse those keys. Isn't that powerful? So like, you know, when you ever hear people say, oh, the church is changing and all this, you know, it's been true. No, it's never will, right? And, and the, the Pope is a Pope, and there's these keys of authority, right? Now, a person can abuse that authority, but there is, there is that, I want to make that point, is that it's a protected authority, right? And God will take those keys away and give it to someone else if they, if they don't do it well, right? And there's this, this thing, but he's the vicar of Christ. Now, what does this mean? The power of the keys includes this. The power of order to administrate the sacraments and bring us salvation the power of jurisdiction to rule over the whole church, and finally, the power to define in questions of faith and morals. Okay, now once again, like the prime minister in time of Isaiah, that was the voice of the king. He's saying, Jesus, I am, all right, that these, these people that are trying to shut you down, they don't have authority. I've only given that authority to my church and to those that I give the authority. Now here's the thing, with other Christian denominations, what's the one thing they don't have? They don't have authority. 
No one has the keys. And that's why the locks keep changing. <laughs> right? I mean, they're opening up all kinds of doors and slamming other ones and changing things. And, and I, I heard from one, one, one poor guy from down in Coward County who was in a Baptist church, became Catholic. But, you know, it was the whole thing about, you know, should we, you know, bless gay marriages? And they went down in the basement of the church and they all voted and said, yes, let's do it. He walked out, so I'm done. Which he should. That's not Christian. The Pope, the Pope, what did the Pope just say? God doesn't bless sin. That was from Pope Francis said that. God doesn't bless sin. Right? That's from the Vicar of Christ, the keys of the kingdom. Right? And so, in other words, like, the problem with the other church, there's no authority. And the thing we have, we have authority. Right? We just have to listen to authority. But we're trained as Americans to what? Question authority. I mean, you, I mean, I remember that it was like, you know, 10 years ago, it was in every bumper, you know, you know question authority, you know? Well, tell that to your parents, you know? So, circling back, with the risen Christ, the saints, the believers in Philadelphia who have been shut out of the Jewish community. Now, remember, one of the problems is that these, these um, that, um, hold on one second, that uh, they, they, this is, they're being persecuted, all right? Um, what we have to step back a little they they were they're being persecuted by the Jews, right? And that were kicked out of their synagogues. These are Jewish, may, probably many Jewish converts to the faith, but they've been completely ostracized and probably kicked out of their businesses and other such things because of their Christian faith. And our Lord is encouraging them. He says this is that I know your works and I know what's happening to you. And he's saying to the believers in Philadelphia, you've been shut out of the community, the Jewish community, but I'm the one who has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So you might, you might have been kicked out of your, you know, your vacation home, but guess what? I got a permanent residence after you die. That's essentially what he's saying to the Philadelphians. All right? Just find a nice place, rent it out, and we'll, we'll, you'll be in paradise forever. Okay? Ocean cities, not that great. Anyway, okay? Uh, and he's, he's given them the, the eternal, eternal um, perspective. And he, he goes, and then he says, despite their limited strength, they have not denied his name. Now, what, is it, what does it mean that he calls these, these particular people in Philadelphia uh, limited strength? Uh, it doesn't mean that necessarily they're weak, but they had a lower social, social status. They didn't have a lot of authority. Remember, we talked about this. Early Christians, they really came from like lower levels of society. Slaves, gladiators. A lot of gladiators became Catholic. Can you imagine? That's pretty cool. That's where the whole Spartacus thing came from, right? Um, you know, business owners. It was, it was um, I mean, at one point, the, the head, one of the first popes was a slave. So, like, the most powerful man in the church was a slave. You know, so it's just, it was a completely different atmosphere. But in the world, they were poor. Right? He says, you don't, I know you're not, I know you're getting beat up because all these Jewish people have a lot of authority and they're kicking you out of this and that. But once again, who's got the keys of the kingdom? I do. I've got the authority. And the little strength means little, and he says, they are not that powerful. And he says, he calls the Jews in Smyrna, he calls them, it's pretty powerful words, the assembly of Satan. Um, now what this means is those that were the Jewish people that were rejecting Catholic Christians in Smyrna. And, uh, but uh, the other thing he says, one of the commendation he says to them is he says, um, despite your limited strength, you have not denied my, his, my name, his name. Right? Now, Think about this. For a Jewish person, what was crime number one? Calling Jesus what? The Messiah. Or calling him Christ, the anointed one. You know, I'll, uh, I'll finish with this one final story. We're going to have to go to, we're going to have to get, we'll finish, but uh, I think it was like three or, it was like four years ago? No, it was three years ago. I just did the baptism for the, for the couple. And um, it was a nice girl, and she came to office, and her, her, hus her fiancé at the time, her prepared for marriage, was, he was Jewish, an Orthodox Jew. I mean, hardcore Jewish guy and like he made it very clear like don't try to don't try to convert me Padre you know like no but I'm going to talk about Jesus a lot okay and we're going to talk about all this stuff so you understand what she believes and I and I told him I'm flat out like you can marry her we give, but you you got to let her raise her faith because we've already agreed upon that kids are going to get baptized we're totally cool with that and I'm like all right and it, it worked out great he had a lot of questions and he respected her faith right but it was like for him like Jesus isn't God, all right? So fast forward. So I, I had to get permission to do a wedding in a hotel. You can do this. When, you, when a 
Catholic Mary is a non-Christian, you can actually, it has to be in a building, it has to be presentable. So the both ministers, the Catholic ministers, and then one of that particular religion can both be present. And so it's blessed by the Catholic Church, and it's also in their particular faith. It's called a dispensation of form. Okay, you have to, the bishop has to give permission. It's a, it's a, it comes from up top. And so it all worked out. We got the paperwork. The bishop signed off on it. Fine. Because, you know, otherwise she couldn't get married. So you have to get permission to marry a non-Catholic from the bishop. Do you know that? Okay. Well, now you know. So when your, you know, please, when your daughter comes like, no, find a Catholic. Wife. But if they don't, they got to get married in the Catholic Church. And they can, but they got to get permission. Okay, just, we'll get, we'll, that's a canon law thing. So fast forward, we're at, the, we're at the rehearsal, and it was in this really ritzy hotel in D.C. And it was, a, I walked in, and it was myself, and, uh, and it was uh, the female rabbi. And uh, I knew within 30 seconds when, I, when she introduced herself, this is not going to go well. Like the body language and everything, I'm like, we're not cool. <laughs> like she just like, like gave me like the power thing, and I was like, oh, she's like this tall. I'm like, all right, you know. <laughs> And I just played it cool. I just completely, it, 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 I, of course, my poker face, right? It was just terrible. Uh, and uh, so we, it, it gets time for the practice. And I start reading the prayers. And I said, through Christ, darling, she stops me. And she goes, you're not going to say that name like that tomorrow, are you? And I'm like, excuse me? Like, I was like, floor, like, I, what? Are you in Jesus Christ? And she's like, don't say that. And she, she goes, come to the side. And I'm like, and she's like, we cannot. We do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. And I was like, ma'am, I hate to break it to you. I do, you know? And she says, well, you're not going to pray that prayer. I was like, all right, you tell mom and dad right now that I'm not doing this tomorrow. You're on your own. And she, they're not getting a Catholic wedding. And she kind of like, eh. Well, can you say something? I'm like, no. Either do the prayers or not. And she's like, and I, I said, you want to talk to them right now? And she's like, all right, we'll do it. So, I know, so she kind of were like, we went through the whole thing. And it, it turned out beautifully, but it was just kind of funny. And actually the reading, the reading for that day at Mass was when the apostles got beaten up because they proclaimed that Jesus was the Lord, you know, was the Christ, you know? So major, major victory for Christ, you know? And uh, the poor parents are like, I'm so, because they went, it was, it was so embarrassing. It happened right in front of all the families. And like both families, like, we're cool with it. There was just this rabbi was just trying to make it difficult, you know? I was like, I thought we had this all figured out. We're cool, Catholic and Jewish, and we're going to, you know, move on. And, uh, but it, it turned out actually very beautiful, and it worked, worked great, and that was that, you know? So, um, but they, they, were get, they, were, they were getting beat up. Why? And they persevered, and they called Jesus the Christ, okay? All right, let's finish, let's finish the promises, because we've we got to finish this church, and we'll do Laodicea next week, which is on my favorite, fam, uh, my favorite topic, lukewarmness. Okay, so... He says um, that, uh, what is it? to those that are faithful, he says, um, let's go back to the text. He goes on to say, um, because you have kept the word of my perseverance and also keep from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come to test those, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have. Okay, well, let's go back. He says, I will make them come down and bow at your feet. Okay, let's talk about that first. That what he's talking about there is what he's going to say, I will make them bow at your feet, means this, is that he will use their su your suffering that they're doing, and I'll flip it, and when they see how you suffer, they're going to convert to Christianity. And truth be told, in Smyrna, because of the, they saw the joy of these, these first disciples of Christ, many people um, repented, uh, many people of the Jews converted to Christianity, because they're like, how can these people under so much suffering still do this? And it converted their hearts. And that, that happens actually today. Sometimes when you become a victim, uh, it helps other people believe, well, man, he or she must what? Must totally believe this, right? Um, and he, said, he says, promise to make them the false Jews become part of the covenant people. Um, he also says he will protect them from the trial that is coming upon the whole world. Uh, the whole world would, would... Now, when he's talking about the whole world, it, it, we talk about the Roman Empire at the time. Okay? Now, when we're listening to it, we're talking about what? The whole world. Now, there's two... There's, there will be a, an ultimate trial that will happen that will test everyone. We're all going to go... When, before Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead, the catechism is very clear. We don't have time to go into this. You can look it up. I'll talk about it next time. 
is there is this there will be this very painful trial that the world will go through now what he says to these people in this particular church and to us if you're faithful I will protect you during this time of what of trial you will be strengthened during this time of trial um, now what could this possibly be? remember we go back to that first class there's two theories what's the theory we're holding that this was this that the vision happened in the 60s right and he wrote it in what the 90s so what would have been the trial that they would have experienced is the destruction of the synagogue and when the Roman Empire started smashing cities okay so when that happened this would be this you know uh, it would have made sense because at this time it would have already happened and they would have already experienced this persecution and and I think what happened remember after the the temple got destroyed all these Jewish people were dispersed around the nation so if John wrote this letter in 64 to 68 um, Emperor Nero was the man who had inaugurated a period of intense Christian persecution intending to wipe out Christianity and the entire Roman world was in turmoil with revolts against Roman rule throughout the Empire and uh, and then this would lead to the destruction of the temple but um, he would protect them all right uh, so that that's what we're talking but there's also that that the, the final thing is uh, there will be this final test for all of us and once again God's saying if you stay faithful I will protect you and you will gain your eternal salvation and secondly you'll keep your crown we talked about that last time does anyone remember the word for the crown are you writing your notes okay anyway uh, but the crown you know the crown remember it talked when you when you finished the race right in the Olympics you were given a crown I will give you once again he's using that imagery when you die you'll have a crown you'll be victorious and then he says you'll be made a pillar in the sanctuary right and what does that mean a pillar in the sanctuary now if you go upstairs right above me right I think more or less or probably right underneath the altar rail there's all these pillars right and um, and so but the thing about the pillars or a pillar in a building it's a very secure part of the building right so what does this mean uh, that because it's a secure part of the uh, what he what he's talking he says if you follow me that I will promise you security and he says uh, because in this particular town we didn't talk about this it was it was uh, plagued with earthquakes always so like these these people were always in fear of earthquakes messing up their homes and even the point where some people like just completely moved out of this particular town and he's but he also earthquakes is reference to things that wreck our lives or turn our life upside down he says with your with your faith I will I will be you'll be sturdy amidst all the earthquakes of life and it will keep you up and if you think about that reference when 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 kind of uh, things when you when uh, earthquakes happen in our life what keeps us keep us joyful is our faith in what it's God I mean what do I have to be afraid of right how often do we panic too right and the Lord is saying no I will make you a pillar and on that pillar he said I will I will inscribe your name um, now interesting point we'll, we'll end here in the cities of Asia Minor and Philadelphia when a priest a pagan priest died um, after a lifetime of faithfulness they would erect a a pillar you know in that in that particular church and put his name on it right are you gonna do that at Sacred Heart <laughs> <laughs> big one you know <laughs> little pillar right and they would put your name on it right and and it was it was but it was but it, what is this reference to this reference is is this is that um, our names will be honored forever in heaven for uh, if we're faithful to God that will be this this permanent structure in heaven right and our names will be revered forever in heaven coming up once again the names is from the name of the book of life which also is referenced prior okay let's end there and there's a lot of a lot of a lot of, a lot of notes uh, we've got through that's great we got through three churches all right three and three we'll do one and then we'll start the next chapter okay um, we'll say a Hail Mary and then I'll answer questions okay in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit amen Hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb Jesus Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John, pray for us.